Okay, thank you all for logging on to today's webinar, Clinical and Ethical Issues Managing Suicide Risk with Individuals Using Substances. I would like to go over some quick housekeeping items about how to use WebEx technology and how to access your CEUs and our evaluation following the survey. We would like to and let everybody know that you can participate in today's webinar via two methods. If you have questions for our presenter or experiencing any technical issues, please use either the chat function or the Q&A panel to communicate your questions. Our presenter, Dr. John O'Neill, is going to answer questions about halfway through the presentation and then again at the end. So feel free to submit questions at any time through the chat panel or the Q&A panel. This webinar has been approved for 1.5 PCB and or NADAC credits, which are free, and you can also request a general certificate of attendance at no charge. Please make note that it will take up to 48 hours for your CEUs to be available in your My IRETA profile because we do have to cross-check attendance on the webinar. After the webinar, you will receive several follow-up emails. The first will be an email with a link to the evaluation. The second will have information on how to access your certificate of attendance and continuing education credits through your My IRETA account. We may send you an additional email to remind you of the evaluation. I would now like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. John O'Neill. Dr. O'Neill directs the outpatient treatment at the Meninger's Clinic location in Bel Air, Texas. He holds a doctoral degree with an emphasis in behavioral health, a master's degree in social work from Arizona State University, and is a licensed clinical social worker, chemical dependency counselor, and a certified sexual addiction therapist. He directed the mental health and sports performance program for the Houston Astros for 12 seasons, he currently manages the mental health program for Major League Baseball's umpire development program. He's a frequent lecturer and media contributor and often speaks about technology use, addiction, suicide, relationships, and attachment. Okay, Dr. O'Neill, if you are ready, I will hand things over to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. Um, thank you all for joining us today um, to talk about a subject that's not always easy to talk about. It's not easy to talk about suicide. It's not easy to talk about the conversation of, about having the conversation with clients, with families, and so on. It's a subject that I think for most of us, we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with our clients. We worry about it. We wonder about it. We stress about it. Uh, the last year has probably been one of the most challenging years for all of us, personally and professionally. It's one of the only times that I can think of in my career where I've been going through many of the same things as my clients. And what we are learning from that is that it leads to people feeling more hopeless uh, to think about, consider ending their lives. And so it's even more important today to talk about and think about how do we address it? How do we do so in an ethical way? How do we appreciate some of the warning signs, some of those risk factors that lead us to, to a path of thinking about harming ourselves? And so I'm going to go through that today, and I do encourage you to ask questions, to, um, to chat about this as we go along, and um, because there's a lot here. And typically, I try to use humor as I do presentations, but I've found that this is a subject that doesn't always lend itself to using a lot of humor. If I do, throughout the course of the presentation, please understand that that's my good Irish way of trying to add a little levity to the conversation. Um, you may have noticed my name's O'Neill, today's St. Patrick's Day, so, you know, we'll just uh, live with the, the Irish luck or the Irish way of living. So, anyway, so I look forward to any questions as we go along. So, so if somebody is saying they don't see the PowerPoint, it's a blank white screen. So as we're getting started, I want to make sure everybody can see my PowerPoint. Any other issues with that? Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to move forward and hopefully someone can address that issue with the PowerPoint. Um, 
So the main objectives for today's presentation is we're going to look at the different risk and protective factors for suicide that are either specific or more prevalent with substance users, with people that we know are using substances. The goal is for us to understand the importance of ethical assessment and treatment of people that might be experiencing suicidal thoughts and people that are also using substances. And we want to use evidence-based strategies to effectively assess and manage suicide behaviors, how to have a conversation with clients about suicide and how to develop approaches to help obviously save their life, keep them living, but also to help them learn to cope differently with the ideations that might lead them into thoughts of suicide. So over the last few years, we've lost quite a few people in the public eye. For everybody we lose in the public eye, we know we're losing people that go unnoticed by society in general. They're not unnoticed by their family and their loved ones, but there are people that we certainly um, recognize in the popular media as losing their lives because of suicide. And so here's just a few. Some of them you may not know, some you may be very familiar with. Uh, Mindy McCready was a country star who ended her life in her 30s. Kate Spade, of course. Uh, Kurt Cobain, Chester Bedingfield, Robin Williams, of course, Anthony Bourdain and Chris Cornell were all people that have, that have lost their lives to suicide, who have suicided. And what's striking about looking at all these people is that you would think, well, gosh, they have it made, they're living the life, they're, they're famous, they're wealthy, they have all of this, but suicide doesn't care. Suicide doesn't care who you are. Suicide doesn't care how rich you are, how famous you are. We have to, in a lot of ways, get out of the mindset that someone looks a certain way. And if they look a certain way, they must be happy. One of the, the greatest challenges as, as a clinician is having a conversation with someone when we don't even think, it doesn't even cross our mind that they might be contemplating suicide, where we look at them and say, they seem fine, they seem to have everything going on. We don't know what demons people have inside until we start asking tough questions, until we start having conversations. I had the opportunity to meet with a family group a couple of weeks ago and a, a group of parents. And we were talking about having a conversation with our adolescents, with our young people about suicide. And so many of the parents were really resident, you know, hesitant, I should say, um, about having that conversation. There was a fear that if you have the conversation, somehow it creates the thoughts. Well, we know that that's not the case. Having a conversation about something isn't magical. It doesn't give people thoughts. It actually gives us the opportunity to prevent the behaviors by having open conversations. And so I, I always want to start a presentation like this saying, we have to develop a comfort level with having a conversation about suicide. We have to develop a comfort level with asking hard questions, asking tough questions when we don't necessarily want to because it's uncomfortable for us. It's not easy to have the conversation. And we're always, for the most part, taking a step back going, gosh, I hope they don't say that they're suicidal. I hope they just say they're safe. And then we just kind of leave it at that. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on the problem of suicide, because I think we could all agree that we know that suicide is a problem. Um, so I'm not gonna go too heavily into the, um, you know, into the, the statistics. I will certainly provide this PowerPoint. There's a question about that for anybody that wants it. I'll be happy to send it out and you can certainly use it as you want. Not a problem. I, I mean, I'm here to, to share this information and, and certainly would hope that you would pass it on, share it with others, use the same presentation. You have my permission, I don't mind. My goal is to try to help people find new approaches, new ways of addressing suicidal thinking. So, so we know that suicide was the 10th leading cause of death in the United States in, in 2020. We know that men died by suicide three to six times more often than women, but women were 1.4 times more likely to attempt suicide. What's really concerning, of course, is that suicide is the second leading cause of death for the ages of 10 to 34. Our young people, our young population, it's the second leading cause of death. Fourth leading cause of death for people between the ages of 35 and 54. We, we know that suicide has higher rates amongst our veterans. I, I do a lot of work with police and first responders, and we know that suicide is also higher amongst all first responders. We're aware that firearms account for slightly more than half of all suicide deaths. And I'm going to talk about the gender differences a little bit, a little bit later. So we know that suicide is a real problem. 
It's also something that carries an enormous stigma with it where people don't want to talk about it. And if someone has attempted to end their life, if they've attempted to suicide, people don't want to talk about it. And they carry the shame with it. They carry the shame that I did this. And so they don't want to tell people. They don't want to try to find support because it's embarrassing and it carries stigma. And for those of us that have never experienced suicidal thoughts, which is very few people, at one point or another, most people think, I don't want to be here. I'd rather not be here. It, it, it can be very tough to embrace somebody and to say, I understand and I hear you and I know you're struggling and I know you're in pain, but we have to be able to do that. We have to give people a safe space to say, I'm feeling this way. I contemplated this and I'm still here, but I'm hurting. And then how do we help them? That's the million dollar question. How do we help them with that? Well, we help them first and foremost by showing compassion, showing understanding, showing that we care. And I know that all that may sound cliche and it may sound like, well, of course we do that. Well, unfortunately, when it comes to stigma, we don't always do that. Whether we're in the helping field or out of the helping field, we aren't always the best at doing that. So there is a significant need for more active interventions to assist people with mental health problems and people with substance use problems. We need to be more active with developing interventions that directly assess and treat and understand suicidal thinking. So, and it needs to be way more preventative than what it is. And so wherever you're working, ask yourself, what is your suicide prevention plan? What's your strategy for preventing suicide? What's your plan to educate people in the community? What's your plan to educate families, to help, to help families become part of the solution, part of the preventative aspect of, of suicide? We know that suicide is preventable. We know that, and we all have to do more. So there's a need for more interventions, and we're part of the intervention. So what do we do? And so that's the question for you to ponder. What are we doing, and what's our strategy? We know that research researchers are telling us that suicides and death from overdoses are going to surpass diabetes deaths, and that's very significant. And, and one of the reasons I bring up overdoses is for so many people that overdose, I tend to wonder how often that is related to suicidal intent or suicidal ideations. So when working with substance users, we need to even be more proactive with asking about thoughts of suicide, desire to suicide, the use of substances as a means to suicide. And when you start to ask those questions and dig into it, it's amazing what you find out. It's scary what you find out, but it's amazing what you find out when you ask those questions. So when you were using opiates, when you were using heroin, when you were injecting or inhaling or smoking or whatever, did you have thoughts of ending your life? Did you think that maybe you would just keep using until the point where you didn't wake up? And I ask questions like that and, and spend a lot of time trying to understand what's the intent. So all too often in, in the field of mental health, we do what I call a suicide flyby. And if I were in the room, I would acted out a little bit better, but we'll just have to go with where I am. <laughs> so uh, the new world of, of video conferencing. So a suicide assessment flyby and is just this. We all ask our clients, we all ask people, hey, are you suicidal? And we're hoping, we're hoping beyond hope that they're going to say, oh, no, I I've never been suicidal. I don't have any thoughts of suicide. I I'm good. And then we're like, whew, that's so, I'm so glad. And then oftentimes we might just move on. We might just move on from it. We may not ask any follow-up questions. We just check the box that, hey, they're not suicidal. They're good. I, I assessed for it. Um, we're good to go. But unfortunately, what we have found and what the research will tell us is that we've got to dig deeper. We have to look at warning signs. We have to look at hopelessness. We have to look at all the other facets that can lead someone to think about suicide, especially the first time we're meeting with somebody, people aren't going to be that honest and that open. They don't know if they can trust us with that information. One of the scariest things to tell somebody is that you're contemplating ending your life. And so why would they just by default tell a therapist, tell a psychiatrist, tell anybody right away? Most people don't. 
So I'm encouraging everybody to think about this idea. Do we do a flyby? Because it's natural, it's human nature that we wanna hear people say, no, I'm not suicidal, so we can move forward. And so we don't have to worry or develop an action plan or anything, because it's a scary thing when a client says to you, you know what, I do think about suicide and I think about it a lot. That's a scary thing. It is. So let's try to move away from the mentality or the thoughts or the ideas of kind of doing a suicide flyby. This is a picture of Chester Benningfield, who was the lead singer of Lincoln Park. And he was laughing and carrying on. And there's other pictures with his family. And they were doing the jelly bean game. Does everybody, I, I can't answer this, but the jelly bean game is that jelly beans were the nasty jelly beans and the good jelly beans. And you eat, I forget what it's called, whatever it is. And he was doing that game. This was the night before he suicided. This is the night before he suicided, this picture was taken. They were playing music, they were playing a game, they were laughing. We don't know what's going on inside somebody. We need to look deeper. And every and I'm a big Linkin Park fan, so this was a huge loss for, for me uh, as a fan, but more as a clinician, knowing that he was in an enormous amount of pain that led him down that path. So, so in this research here in 2017, Basically, what it's the sum, summation of this is that we know that a lot of Americans have serious thoughts of suicide. 10, 11, 12 million people have serious thoughts of suicide and that we have millions of people who attempt suicide every year. But we have also another million that make plans and attempts. And then we have people that have no plans and then they attempted. In other words, it was an impulsive act that led them. So millions of people are struggling each and every year. So I mentioned a little bit ago that I was going to talk about the means. So commonly, when we think about how someone suicides, we think of, for men, we think of firearms as the primary means that they end their life, how they end their life. And that's true. 56% of all suicide among men is, is the use of a firearm. But let's not underestimate hanging, suffocation, and so on, that is almost 28% of all means for men. And then overdoses poisoning is about not is nine percent so the interesting thing and I, I do this when i'm doing this presentation with other groups is i'll say well, what do you think is the, is the case for women what are females and then most people think well it's going to be you know mostly poisoning a little bit of, of of hanging and maybe a tiny bit of firearms well interestingly enough the truth is that poisoning and firearms for female are just about equal and hanging suffocation is not far behind. And so the reason I say this is when I talk to first responders and, and I've collected this over the years, I'll say, when you're talking to a client that you get a welfare call, care on, uh, call on and they're saying this person could be suicidal and you're talking with a male person who, um, who could be suicidal, do you ask them about handguns? And they're always, of course, we always ask and everything else. And then I'll ask, so when you're talking to a female who could be suicidal, do you ask about handguns? And almost every time the answer is no. Almost every time first responders will say, well, women don't end their life with firearms. That's not true. Okay, that's not true. I mean, females end their lives with firearms as well. So the reason why this is important is we need to look at all means. Of, of any way that someone might in their life, and we need to equally ensure safety as best that we can. Uh, whether it's medications, whether it's handguns, the old idea that if someone wants to suicide, they'll suicide needs to go out the window. The reality is many people suicide because they are in a state of despair where they're impulsively saying, I don't want to live here. And if the means are readily available for them, they will take them. If we eliminate each of the steps, each of the means, whether that's a gun, medications, an object that they might use, that they might have prepared. I've had clients that have gone to, to hardware stores and learn and have learned how to tie knots. And they had their rope and their knot in their room ready to go for the time when they wanted to end their life. Well, guess what? Having them remove that, ensure that that isn't in their room, doesn't mean they can't go back to a hardware store, but it means that the impulsive act will be lessened. And so removing the means means a lot, okay? Not to use the word means twice, but that, that there's a lot of truth to that. So we have to get out of the mindset that women don't use firearms because they do. 
the terms that I'm going to be using for the rest of the presentation that I think are important. Um, and there's been some shifts in the research over the years about understanding risk and understanding warning signs. So it's important to understand what a risk factor is, which are stressful events or situations that may increase the likelihood. None of this is predictive. We, we cannot predict whether or not someone's suicide is going to suicide. What we can predict is that when someone has these symptoms, they're more likely to be wanting to self-harm or wanting to escape or so on and so forth. So we need to look at it from not a predictive standpoint, but from what are we learning about this person based on their symptoms, based on their behaviors. Protective factors are personal and social resources that can promote resiliency, reduce the potential, and, and, and reduce other high-risk behaviors. Per, perhaps the risk behaviors of using substances or putting themselves in dangerous situations and so on. And then the warning signs, which are the early observable signs that indicate increased risk of suicide. Um, so what are those warning signs? And those warning signs tend to tick up in the days leading up to a suicide attempt. And so if we understand the warning signs, we recognize them and we start to have an active conversation with clients about how do we manage these signs? Because many clients don't necessarily recognize their warning signs until we start to have more of a conversation about suicide. Let's talk about these these signs. What are your unique warning signs that tell you that you're not doing well? And we all can probably relate to that because each of us have warning signs that say that we're not doing great. Whether it's we're not sleeping well or we don't feel well physically or we're hungry or we're irritable or whatever, we all have warning signs. And maybe we have family members that have certain warning signs that uh, if you don't feed them, they're going to be angry and grumpy or something along those lines. I have a few of those in my family that when they're when they're hungry, they're just tough to be around. Now, obviously, those are relatively innocent warning signs, but when we get to the, an understanding of the warning signs that lead people down a perilous path of death, um, that sounded super dramatic, I understand, and I didn't necessarily mean it to be that dramatic, but it it's true, though. These warning signs are, are very much the roadmap. When someone says, when I'm not sleeping well, and I'm feeling very anxious and I've had a shaming loss, maybe a relationship breakup or I've lost a job. So many of the things we've been experiencing in the last year, so many of the things that people have been experiencing in the last year, we've had more people losing jobs. We've had financial stresses. We've had relationships ending. We've had fear of a physical illness and so on. So many of those are warning signs collectively for society, but for each individual, those could be the warning signs that they're, they're contemplating ending, ending their life. So the majority of suicides occur amongst people who have a mental health and a substance use disorder, which account for two thirds of all suicides. So when someone comes in and they have a depressive disorder or bipolar disorder, and they're also struggling with an alcohol disorder, a marijuana disorder, um, you know, I don't want to get too much into the politics of marijuana, but marijuana for so many people is used as a coping mechanism. And for the suicidal person, and, I, and I, I'll be honest, I've had clients that have said, hey, the only thing that keeps me from ending my life is the fact that I can smoke marijuana. Well, I'm not one to say stop smoking marijuana if it's going to end your life. I'm one to say, how do we develop a plan to get other ways of coping into your system? How do you cope differently without having to smoke marijuana every day um, and, and so on. So I will embrace wherever they are to stay alive. The most important aspect of all of this is how do we keep people living? But we need to understand that for people that have a mental health and a substance use disorder combined, that they are at a significant higher risk of contemplating suicide. So for people who are sober, and this is an area that we don't always talk enough about, some of the the largest risk for people is when someone stops using a substance. And if we were in person, I would, you know, get in some interaction about what's it like when you're around somebody who stopped smoking cigarettes and how many of you have been around somebody who stopped smoking cigarettes? Well, most of us have, and we know that many people, when they stop smoking cigarettes, they're not always feeling great. They're not always in the best place. In fact, sometimes you want to buy them a pack of cigarettes or a carton of cigarettes just to deal with their irritability and their anxious anxiety and all the other stuff. Well, when people are stopping their substance use, whether it's alcohol, whether it's opiates, whether it's marijuana, cocaine, 
so on and so forth, whatever it might be, they are not feeling great. We all know this. That's such an obvious statement, right? You're going, well, that's obvious. They're not feeling great. But what's less obvious is sometimes when you're not feeling great and you take away the very thing that helped you cope with your mental health problems, you take away the very thing that helps you cope with the thoughts of death, and that's gone, we can run into people who are feeling so hopeless that they're like, why bother? Why bother? And so we have to understand this idea, and I'm, I imagine many of you have heard of post-acute withdrawal symptoms, but it's really this persistence of subtle yet significant emotional and psychological problems. So really for people, they go through these major symptoms where they have some cognitive issues, where they have memory problems, where they have emotional mood swings, um, sleep disturbances. Sleep is linked in, in so many studies to problems with suicidality. Sleep is linked to problems with mental health in general. It's also going to be one of the primary warning signs that we're going to explore in a little bit. So people struggle with motor coordination, dizziness, difficulty managing stress. And so post-acute withdrawal symptoms are way more than just thinking about or wanting to use substances. They are the emotional consequences that come with stopping a substance, and they place people at a greater risk for contemplating suicide. So it's not just about somebody's in an, an acute crisis. It can be making a change that changes and all that alters the way they cope. And in doing so, we need to be mindful of that and to explore how are you feeling, what are you experiencing, and what are you going through as someone is withdrawing emotionally and physically from a substance. So some aspects unique to suicide and, oh, and substance use, I wanna spend a little time on this. The number of opiate prescriptions currently active in pharmacies equal our adult population, okay? Think about that for a second. And that this is even a couple of years ago, and that has not changed. I know there's been some work done to try to change it, but we know that there's a strong correlation between opiate use and suicide and there's a lot of reasons for that. Okay. So, and again, so again, I have to put my reading glasses on for some of this. Uh, yeah. And that's a great question, David. Um, oh, I won't, you said privately, so I won't say who you are. So yeah, there's a lot of issues with people not wanting to smoke, stop smoking marijuana because they feel that it's a lot better than the side effects of medication. I hear that all the time. And like anything, I use a very motivational enhancement, motivational interviewing type style with people. And I try to explore what it is that they're willing to do, what they're willing to change. And it's not, un, it's not an unrealistic concern that clients have. And so one of the first things that I do with most clients is I don't try to argue with them about it. I don't say, well, hey, this medication is better than smoking pot. In, in their case, it may not feel that way. And in their case, I understand that they're having some significant side effects so it's really important to, I think, join with them and appreciate that, and then to help build a plan for perhaps trying other things. And so, and I've worked with psychiatrists over the years where we've talked about some of their thoughts and ideas and, and expressed some of the concerns about side effects and so on. So it's a legitimate issue that need, I think definitely needs to be addressed. So, and it's true for all, all substances. As when people get into a place where they say, you know, I'm using the substance because it helps me feel better. If you use opiates, you get to escape whatever physical and emotional pain you might be having. And so we have to understand that when someone comes in and they're an opiate user, that they're at an even higher risk for accidental death. We know that, but they're at a higher risk for suicidal thinking and behaviors. And so that's what this research was looking at. So we also know that alcohol use, that alcohol use is associated with impulsive, especially impulsive methods of suicide, where someone gets drunk and they decide to end their life. And we know that as people get older and everything else, and as they use, as they use more and more substances, it's harder to cope. The substance use, especially like an alcohol, becomes the preventative or becomes the main way that someone copes. And so many of us probably can relate to that if if you've uh, spent any time in the last year, like looking at memes and looking at all the wine o'clock things that people have talked about and all the joking about substance use, I, I, I'm gonna be interested to see how much alcohol was sold in, in 2020. I suspect it'll be a lot, um, just a little, a little tidbit. So in the first few months, I'm here in Texas, 
In the first few months, one of the quickest things that the government here in Texas did was made liquor stores a, an essential service. And not only that, for the first time in Texas, you could have to go alcohol. We've never had to go alcohol in Texas before. So the interesting thing is I was at a taco place and I'm like, I would like two taco dinners. I would like two taco dinners and uh, for my wife and I, and they were like, well, hey, would you like a gallon of margaritas? And I'm like, uh, no, I just want the two taco dinners. And they're like, well, the gallon of margaritas are $6.99 or whatever it was. And, you know, you can take it with you right now. And they were just really hard selling this gallon of margaritas. And I get it. When people are in pain, we want to ease our pain. And when someone is in just everyday normal stress and pain, we want to ease it, right? If you're someone who's depressed, who's struggling emotionally, and alcohol can soothe your pain, I understand that. I understand that. And so it's really important to, to assess what can they do instead of drinking. At the same time, appreciating that it's not going to be an easy thing for them to just stop using alcohol, stop smoking marijuana, stop using opiates, and so on. I haven't necessarily seen stimulants being as associated with suicidal behaviors uh, as, as much as I've seen alcohol and opiates, the depressant type substances I've seen much more associated with suicidal behaviors. So what we know is that alcohol increases the likelihood of an attempt. So alcohol and drug use second only to depression and mood disorders. Um, this was some in a violent death reporting system study a while back. It looked at people who had suicided and 62% of people in this study had at least a 0.08 um, level, blood alcohol level in their system when they died. So, and I'm not gonna belabor the point. We know that alcohol is a lubricant for, for ending your life. We know that that is the case for so many people. I, I have more concerns now with the fact that it's so easily available. I guess we have delivery services now. We didn't used to have delivery services, but you can stay in your home and they will deliver a case of whatever or bottles of whatever. It's pretty amazing. And I, I understand, I, I just, from a mental health perspective, have some worries and concerns about that. And I think it means we need to be having even more tough conversations with people. We need to be even more on guard and, and appreciate that the access to substances has increased for so many people, including adolescents. Um, adolescents have a much easier way, um, a, a much easier, I think, uh, avenue to use substances. So, so we know that long-term substance use places people at greater risk. Um, I'm sure over the years, we've all learned more and more about neuroscience. We've learned, learned more and more about how the brain changes because of substance use. We know that dopamine, serotonin, all of the good neurotransmitters that help us feel better and help us manage emotional pain get changed, adapted, deadened, whatever we want to call it, the longer we use substances. And so that also contributes to that post-acute withdrawal piece that I was talking about, that your brain's no longer making the neurotransmitters the way that they should. And so when you're not using substances, your brain's like, this is terrible. This is miserable. Why would I do this? Why would I be sober? And so maybe you're sitting in a treatment program or you're in an IOP or you're whatever your commitment is to not using and you're absolutely miserable. You're absolutely miserable. So when a person stops using, they may no longer cope. They may no longer cope with their mental health illness. And that's going to lead to a possible increase in acute suicide risk because they're not coping anymore in the way that they used to cope. We also know that the longer someone uses a substance, the more at risk they are. So the longer someone is using alcohol, the longer they're using any of the substances, the more at risk they are. And depression and higher suicide probability are common consequences among substance use. But the longevity of someone's use will contribute to the higher risk or the more, the more powerful warning that this person could be at risk for thoughts of suicide. So when we're assessing, for, assessing people for suicidality, we need to look at all these factors. You know, what, you know, what is the, the length of their use? What are the reasons behind their using? How do they feel when they stop using? What's it like for them when they quit using substances? So suicide, uh, substance use risks, just in general, and this is based on my experience of working with substance users for a long, long time. I, I got my start working with fraternities and sororities at, uh, at a college in Texas and then at Arizona State. So anytime you meet with fraternities and sororities and talk about alcohol and substances, um, I can tell you that's a tough group to talk to. So staring here at a screen without any interaction or any affect 
is not nearly as challenging as it was talking to fraternities and sororities that absolutely didn't want to hear me talk. So that's how I got my start in this. And over the years, I've certainly learned things like when someone has substance use on board, it makes it easier to go through with, an, with a suicide attempt. Okay. There's a question that I'll, I'll address here when we pause here in a second. So, so we know that it increases the risk of attempting through more lethal means and that someone has less, just less, um, I think they're more enhanced, their thoughts are more enhanced about, well, I can, I can do it this way. I'm going to be more successful and, and take this risk. And so people are more willing to try means that they wouldn't try when they're intoxicated. So things that they would have never considered. There's an increased risk of overdose. We have learned over the years that the use of benzodiazepines um, and alcohol is a frequent method that people will use, whether intentionally or unintentionally. One of the scariest things to work with are adolescents who are experimenting with Xanax, um, bars is the term that's used around here a lot, experimenting with bars and alcohol. Those are dangerous, dangerous substances that go together when they, when they put them together. So the increased risk of overdose is real with all the substances. The impulsiveness that occurs when you've been using, and I always kind of use the joke that most people, um, when they drink and use other drugs, you know, they they think they can dance and karaoke and that they're more attractive than what they are and everything else. And that's the humorous take on it. But the sad part is that when people are intoxicated, they're going to make more impulsive decisions. They're going to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do because of the of their impaired judgment, which is the last part here. So, so there's a question here. I want to get to going to got to go to the reading glasses. So, yes, the question is, am I referring referencing illicit and opiates? I'm talking about um, I'm not talking necessarily about mental health pharmaceuticals, but I'm talking about any types of prescription drugs that are abusable. And certainly there's mental health pharmaceuticals that are abusable. The benzos, as I was just getting at a second ago, are certainly part of all of this. So I'm talking collectively about anybody abusing any substance. So if you're abusing clonopin, if you're abusing Adderall, again, the stimulants are not as closely linked to uh, substance use and suicide for some reason. And maybe the, the, you know, the folks that are using the stimulants are not feeling as depressed or feeling as, as anxious or whatever it might be. I'm that, not saying it doesn't happen. And we should certainly account for any substance use as being a potential risk factor. But so much of the risk, um, so much of the risk is is related to alcohol, opiates, benzos, some of those de those depressants, and, and marijuana as well. So, so some of the unique factors that are important to pay attention to is that, and this was just a, such an interesting piece of research here that was talking about having a higher incident of suicidal ideations after a primary care visit, for whatever reason that is. And I will tell you, I've run into this a few times with clients. Who have gone to their primary care visit after a, a physical and lab work, and they were given not great news about their lab work. A client that has um, symptoms of cirrhosis or symptoms of, of gastrointestinal problems or whatever it is. And so this is such interesting and important research because it's not a question we necessarily ask, but it is a question we should ask. When was the last time you went to your primary care doctor? What was the visit about? You know, I mean, I know it sounds like we're prying, but we're in the business of prying. We're in the business of asking tough questions. And so this was a really important piece of research that I learned about a few years ago. And so I incorporated this into my assessment where I'm asking people about their primary care visits. I'm asking them about their medical health and things along those lines because of the incidence of the higher incidence of suicidal ideations after a primary care visit. So. This this whole piece here is talking about the you know how people talk about it you know how people talk about it and the importance of an alliance with a healthcare professional you know how ally you know allied are people with us so how do we look at their interpersonal relationships how do we look at where they are you know where they are are struggling with relationships whether that's friendships romantic relationships work relationships this is telling us we've got to get deeper in looking at someone's relationships. We have to get deeper into it. And let's not just focus on, on who they're dating or who they're in a relationship with. Let's look at how they're feeling about relationships at work, how they're feeling about their social relationships outside of work, their friendships. We have to look deeper. And that's what this is getting at, that someone's interpersonal 
relationships are very impactful on, on their thoughts of suicide. We know that um, bipolar also tends to be a significant risk factor for so many people, you know, who are struggling. So I've got another question here. Go up, go up. There we go. Maybe not. Well, I'll, I'll figure out how to make that work in a second. So, so we know that it's important to look at all comorbid, comorbidity. All right. So anybody that struggles, as I was saying before, with mental health and substance use, they're going to have higher risk factors related to substance use or related to suicide. It's really important to look at that. Anxiety is something that I imagine we can all probably relate to today. Um, this is a, an anxiety provoking world that we're living in at the moment. And, and sometimes anxiety, while it may seem like, well, you know, you're just worried, you're just, you're just struggling with everyday worries and everyday concerns. What a lot of this research is saying is that we need to assess more for anxiety and we need to look at the different cognitive problems and we have to target the vulnerabilities that someone might feel and might have because anxiety can certainly trigger a, you know, a thought of, I don't want to be here anymore. This world is too scary. I'm not safe. And I don't want to be in a world that's too scary and not safe. And so it's really important to think about um, how do we assess for and understand um, anxiety as well. So I mentioned before that sleep problems continually are associated with mental health problems, substance use problems, and obviously with suicidal thinking. So being awake at night heightened the risk of suicidal thoughts and attempts. And that prolonged failure to achieve a good night's sleep made life harder. It added to depression and it increased it negative attention difficulties in inactivity. So I'm hoping that all of us do some assessment of sleep. How are you sleeping? What's the quality of your sleep of your sleep? Are you waking too much? Do you feel rested? Do you find it difficult to go to sleep? And so on, because too many people do not have enough, um, I think, attention paid to their sleep patterns. And so it's easy for us to just say, well, that makes sense. We're living in stressful times. I understand you have problems with sleep. Well, we need to go deeper. And I think a big part of my message today is that we have to go deeper. We have to ask deeper questions. We have to move beyond kind of our, our first line set of questions that we're used to asking. Kind of business as usual. We ask these questions, we move on, and then we get to the core reason that they're treating, that they need treatment or the core reason that they're there to see us today. We've got to go beyond that. We got to move in into a place of understanding and say, well, if someone identifies that they use substances and they have sleep problems, we need to really target those and say, okay, what can we do to address your substance use? What can we do to address your sleep problems? And can we understand or develop an understanding of what does it mean for them? What does it mean for them? How do they understand it? What's their perspective of why they're using substances and, and how do they understand their sleep problems? And what are, you know, what are, um, you know, what are some of the ways that they can improve the, the things they're struggling with like sleep? And so, and yes, I'm, there's a question about is psychotherapy useful for reducing suicide attempts and addicts? We're gonna talk about that um, at, near the end here. And so I'll certainly get to that, so. And I love this comment that anxiety can be physically and mentally painful. Anxiety is the most common disorder that Americans face. All right, it doesn't get the attention that some of the other disorders, but it is the most common disorder. And unfortunately, it oftentimes gets dismissed by family and friends as, oh, you just worry too much. And I, I do a whole lecture on, on what not to say to somebody with anxiety. And some of the most common things that people will say is, oh, it'll get better, don't worry about it. You know, it's not that bad, everybody goes through it. All of those things are not helpful for someone with anxiety. They don't help somebody feel better or held or cared for or any of that stuff. And so, you know, keep training families to be supportive is a big part of all this. How do you support someone who's struggling with anxiety or struggling with depression or struggling with substance use? You know, the family work. I'm a family guy. I'm, a, I'm an attachment guy. I'm big on family relationships and family systems. So, so much of this is, is certainly not just about treating the individual. It's about treating the whole system and teaching and training and developing support amongst a family system is really, really important. So I'm not going to spend way too much time on the ethical piece of this, but I'll spend enough for us to get a good flavor for what we need to be doing ethically. And so much of this, you might say, okay, John, um, we know this, this is fine, but I'm going to say it again anyway, because we need to make sure these are all things that we're doing in terms of practicing an ethical way. Okay. Practicing in the most ethical way. 
Number one is that we need to go to trainings like we're going to today. We need to learn more. The 90 minutes that we're going to talk today, or I'm going to talk at you today, is not enough. We need to do more to learn about styles of talking to people, your own style. We need to do more to learn about the research and the techniques and the approaches, the conversations, the relationships, all the things that go into it. We need to recognize the suicide warning signs and the risk before the problems arise. And we do that by learning more. So we need to have our own strategy, our own risk management process. We need to have our own assessment process. Everybody on this call, I challenge you, look at your process. Look at your assessment process. You may have a rock star suicide plan that is amazing. You may have the best assessment. Just go ahead and look at it and say, are we missing something? Ethical care starts with reevaluating and assessing our own capacity for handling a problem. We need to re we need to all do that. My hospital where I work, we do that. We assess it, we reassess it, we have other people look at it. We go, okay, are we doing the right things? Everybody has ongoing training on addressing suicidal thinking, suicidal behaviors, and then we have ongoing training to work with families, and then we train families and we train first. We, we just do a lot. I'm not saying we're perfect, we don't have all the answers, but we bring in consultants and experts to train us, to get us better, to say, how do we do this? Ethical care starts there. Know your, the research, know the risks, understand what to do and how to, how to handle it. It's important to understand your laws and your statutes in the community. I've worked with, with people over the years, other professionals, who can get kind of handcuffed by the laws and the, and the, and the policies and the procedures in their own um, counties or their own states or countries or whatever it is. So we need to all understand what do our statutes say? I have a personal philosophy that when it comes to someone's life, I don't care in that way. I care about their life, number one. I'm not going to worry so much about confidentiality or this or that if I truly am worried and concerned based on understanding warning signs, based on understanding what I know about suicide, I feel like I can justify making a call that could ultimately lead to someone saying you violated my confidentiality or you did something unethically or whatever. I think the ethical care comes in having the knowledge and understanding that you're hearing and seeing warning signs that are strong enough to lead you to be concerned that someone could end their life. And that's where I don't think you get yourself into trouble. You get yourself in trouble if you get stuck on the laws and the regulations. So we need to know them. We need to appreciate them. We need to know what our state, our, our organizations, our agencies, what they all say, what their policies are, their procedures are. But we also need to be prepared to make tough decisions when we're worried that someone's life is on the line. So we need to know community resources. We need to know community resources before there's a crisis, before it's midnight. Because like uh, I'm sure all of you have smoke detectors in your house. Have you ever noticed that every smoke detector goes off at 2 a.m.? meaning that the battery goes out and the light goes off and it's always at 2 a.m. Never in my life has one of my smoke detectors at noon on a Saturday beeped and said, oh, replace the battery. It's always 2 a.m., right? So I say that because a crisis situation doesn't happen when it's convenient, okay? It, a crisis situation does not happen when it's convenient. When it's 10.30 on a Wednesday and you have plenty of time in the daytime to manage a crisis, no, no, no. A crisis situation happens at 11.30 on a Sunday night when you're exhausted in bed. So you need to know the resources, you need to know the crisis services, you need to know the mental health services that are maybe associated with law enforcement. All of those things need to be part of your plan ahead of time. That needs to be something that you understand. If you're in private practice, it's even more important. I mean, it's important no matter what, but if you're in private practice, and you have the message on your phone that says, hey, if this is an emergency, call 911 and all that, that's fine and good. So, but at the same time, you have a responsibility to be able to direct people to the right services. Um, going the 911 route, I will tell you that most research will tell us that a very large percentage of people who are suicidal are not gonna call 911. Okay. And I will definitely talk about the idea of a safety contract. So that's a great question. I will definitely talk about that. We don't use safety contracts, we use safety plans. And I'll talk about the big difference um, in a little bit. So, but most people aren't gonna call 911. If they're suicidal, they're not gonna call 911. So if you're in private practice, you've left a message 
that says, hey, if you're in crisis, um, basically, I'm not going to call you back because it's after hours. So call 911. Most nobody, most, most all clients aren't doing that. Very few of them are going to do that. So you need to be able to show that proactively ahead of time, you've done some work to say, if you're in crisis, here are the resources. Here's who to call. Here's where to go ahead of time. In my initial paperwork, when I do private work with anybody, I list that out. I talk about what to do in the event of a crisis. And I list out the community resources. I list out crisis lines. I list out all these different places that someone can go and the things that they can do, as opposed to just call me and let my cell phone tell you that you need to call 911. Okay, and I know I'm, I'm being a little harsh on this, but that's a common, normal, accepted practice. I get it, but we need to be more proactive from an ethical standpoint. And we need to demonstrate that we're sharing with our clients that here are some things to do when you are in crisis, when you are thinking about suicide and so on. So we need to know what the literature says. We need to know what the research says. We need to, using the example of a safety contract, the research will tell us that safety contracts where you have clients sign off and say, I will not suicide are absolutely not helpful. Those are not things that any of the research, the best practices, the evidence would tell you to do. Instead, they will say that a safety plan is a negotiated set of, of warning signs and coping skills and behaviors that people have all agreed on, that the person has agreed on, the family's aware of, you're aware of, and that's the safety plan. And that's where the evidence says is a healthy way of addressing or is a healthy way of addressing suicidal thinking. Whereas the old contract that, and I'll tell you, when I orig originally started in this field, we all had the suicide contracts. That's what we did. Um, we would get them to sign and we go, okay, sign this line that says you agree to call me or to call this or to do this before you end your life, before you suicide. And you guys may have noticed, I'm not saying committed suicide. I'm saying suicide. We're taking the word commitment to dying out. And in a lot of the research using this as a good, good example in this evidence piece, a lot of the, the, the wording and the literature and a lot of the experts, and I'm not saying I'm an expert, I'm just learning like everybody else. They're telling us we don't want to say committed suicide. We want to say suicide. We want the commitment to living. We don't want the commitment to dying. And so it may sound like a play on words, but I think everything, as you all know, matters when it comes to wording. So, so I challenge all of you, learn what the literature says. If you work with a specific type of population culturally, if you work with a, a group of people, obviously we want to learn about each person's culture, but if you're working with a segment of the population that maybe you need to understand more about their unique aspect or their unique way that they handle suicidal thinking, learn about it. What does the research say? What are the best practices in that area and so on? Stay current with developments in the field, continue to attend education programs that'll help you stay sharper and will help you address these types of situations. Okay, so using supervision, Okay, using supervision, I still use supervision. We do not treat clients alone. And I know people are in private practice, and if you're in private practice, I encourage you to have practice groups, practice supervision, work with other colleagues where you can talk about these tough care, these tough cases, these tough situations, where you can get feedback and guidance. Because working with the suicide client is exhausting, and it's draining, and it's terrifying at every turn. And I will tell you after 30 years, I know I look really young. I started when I was 10. See, that's my Irish humor I'm trying to use. Um, after 30 years of doing this, if I didn't have good colleagues, good peers, good supervisors, I couldn't continue to do this. Okay. We need to be demonstrating for ourselves and for our clients that we're seeking out consultation with professionals, that we're using supervision and that we're consulting and saying, I don't know what to do with this client. What do you think? And then we're documenting it. That we're documenting that we're using supervised supervision and we're using peer consultation and everything else. Obviously, record keeping is very important. And no matter what your style is, whether it's writing a whole lot or writing a whole little, we need to continually assess and demonstrate that we're assessing for suicidality, for suicidal thinking, for the warning signs, and so on. And if we have a safety plan in place, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. Um, I keep teasing the safety plan. We'll get to it, I promise. Um, if you have a safety plan that you're continually addressing and updating and documenting where you are with the safety plan. 
So I have a few clients right now that we have safety plans and I go over the safety plan with them almost every session. And we talk about where are we, where are we at, what are your signs, how are you doing, how are you feeling, what are you committing to, what changes do we need to make, what do we need to do to edit, and so on. So we need to document all activities performed on behalf of the, of the client, um, all the consultations, the referrals, the crisis plan that we're working on, the safety plan, any telephone calls, coordination with other providers. So as a clinical social worker, I coordinate with psychiatrists. Well, when I'm dealing with a client that I'm very much worried about struggling with, I will promise you this, I'm coordinating more with that psychiatrist. And we are having conversations about our thoughts, our feelings, our worries, our concerns, our, and our plan ultimately. And then crisis coverage. I, I hit on that quite a bit already, but so it's not always possible for people to provide 24 hour cough office coverage. I get that. But I think that when you have clients that you've identified as being suicidal, you need to go beyond the 911 voicemail. There needs to be an active plan in place to address crisis situations. And that's very, very important. And that may mean that you spend more time addressing here are the services you can use. Here are the, the hotlines. Here are the places you can call. Here's what you can do. And, and I know that um, for so many people, it's, it's we need our time off. We need our break. Of course we do. But we need to think about it differently when we know that we have a suicidal client, a client that's at great risk and has significant warning signs. So we assess this through a number of ways, but I want to talk a little bit about Joyner's theory of suicide. And these three things, I think, get demonstrated all the time. I'm alone, I'm a burden, and I'm not afraid to die. When you have a client that feels alone, feels like they're a burden to themselves and others in society, and they don't have fear of dying, we know that this theory is, is, I think, very, very accurate. So we need to look at those things, ask ourselves those questions. Does our client feel alone? Do they feel like they're a burden? And do they not have any fear of dying? So Harvard Medical School talks about risk assessment as looking at clinical judgment based on risk in the near, very near future, based on looking at all the available information. Um, and it's, it's a reasonable approach to saying this person could be at great risk for suicide. So that's great. And I think it's a wonderful summation uh, of what risk assessment is. But part of what we're learning is we need to move away from risk factors and into warning signs. And what I mean by that is the old days, and we would look at risk factors. We'd say, well, there are 52 year old white male who just got divorced who you know is has ten guns at home because this is Texas. Everybody has lots of guns. So, huh, so anyway, so and they're probably at risk for suicide. That may or may not be the case. We can't look at these risk factors as being the end all be all. Instead, what a lot of the research will tell us, what a lot of the the evidence will 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 tell us is we need to look at warning signs. So we need to look at warning signs. So the warning signs are these things: are they agitated? Do they have anxiety and panic attacks? Do they have current substance use? So I'm going to talk about protective factors here in a minute too. So I'm going to give you a list. So that'll help. So do they have social withdrawal? I said shaming losses, which is down here at the bottom, but shaming losses is a biggie for people, which can lead to social withdrawal. You lost a job, you lost a relationship, maybe you're, you lost your house, you are financially in, in bad places. The sleep problems, insomnia, nightmares, you don't have purpose. I'm a big fan of helping clients find purpose. When someone loses a job and loses a relationship, then they may not feel like they have much purpose. And if they don't have purpose, they start to ask themselves, why am I here? Why bother? I'm a burden. Um, I'm alone. No one cares. And you know what? I'm, I'm just not afraid to be, be dead. I'd rather be dead than to go through all of this. So people who lack purpose, who've had these shaming losses, and then people who start to develop plans and desperation. Take these warning signs on the right side here and look at every one of these with your clients. Are they agitated? Are they struggling with anxiety? All of these things. I promise you this doing so will help us move away from these old risk factors that weren't particularly helpful. Okay. So the American Association of Suicidology says here are the expanded warning signs. And I put this in here really for your reference when I send this out, but it's a lot of the same things. Hopelessness, feeling trapped, rage, reckless, mood changes, substance use, no purpose. That repeatedly throughout the least the, the literature will say will will come up. The lack of purpose. I don't have it. What's the point? I don't have a purpose. 
So the American Association of Suicidology put together, I think, a really helpful kind of easy way to think about it. It's called Is Path Warm? Ideation, substance use, purposelessness, and so on. Anxiety, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but you can certainly see that. But it's a helpful way, and I've actually integrated this into some of my clinical notes as a helpful way for me to remember and go, okay, are they struggling with these things? Are they looking at, you know, are, are they, are they, are any of these identified in the clients that I'm working with? And then what does that mean? Because it's not good enough to ask a client, are you suicidal? That is not that helpful. The majority of people are going to say, no, 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 I, I'm not. Because they actually have a lot of shame when you ask that question, right? So instead of asking the question, are you suicidal? Let's look at the warning signs. And then as we look at the warning signs, it's amazing what happens when you say, well, you know, I'm hearing all these things and, and I'm just wondering, are there times in your life where you contemplate ending, ending it? Are there times when you think about suicide? And, I, I, and so I'm softening it in a way based on what I'm learning. I'm not saying, well, based on all the things I heard, it sure sounds like you would be suicidal. <laughs> not what I'm saying, but, you know, I'm, but I'm basing it on what I'm hearing. I'm not just checking it off as an obligation. You know, hey, you know, you're not suicidal, are you? I've literally had people I've, I've supervised do that um, in some of our in some of our trainings where they're like, they're just basically just trying to get on from it as, as fast as they can. So the assessment piece, and like I said, we will I will share this PowerPoint with all of you and you're welcome to do what you want with it. You can pass it on, throw it away, do whatever you want. But the assessment piece is such an important part of this. But getting into the interventions, I'm going to spend the last 30 minutes on on the interventions piece. Um, and and I. I Put this little quote here, this little cartoon here, because it relates to me a lot. And it's the, I pity the fool who can't stop quoting old TV shows. And that's obviously a reference to Mr. T on the A-Team. And some of you may know who that is, some of you may not. And I say that because we have to connect with our clients in a relevant way. And sometimes it's hard to do that as we age. And our clients are talking about uh, TikTok and, and all these other things. And you're going, what is that? And we have to find a way to connect. And we have to do so because the connection and the relationship and the rapport sets the foundation for having tough conversations about how people are feeling and how they're doing. And so we've got to find a way to find this connection. And so engagement is probably to me one of the single most important interventions that we can have, engaging our clients. And in the right-hand corner, you'll see um, the, the, one of the logos for the greatest rock and roll band of all time, and that's Guns N' Roses. And I'm sharing that with you because you're like, well, of course, that's true. We know that Guns N' Roses is the greatest rock and roll band of all time because we've got to come up with commonalities and we've got to come up with ways to connect with our clients that are not threatening, especially early on when we're getting to know clients. They don't necessarily trust the process or trust the system. So I spend a lot of time building the relationship, um, talking about things that are less threatening. So if a client walks into my office with a Dallas Cowboy shirt on, for example, I'm in Houston, so I might make them leave and say, I can't work with you because you're a Cowboys fan. But in all reality, we may have a conversation for a few minutes about football. We may have a conversation about something that they're interested in. In other words, I just want to have a human relationship that's not all about the clinical reasons for, for, you know, for them coming into my office. The most fundamental and important function of working with a client is engaging them, especially if we want to get them to a place where they'll talk to us openly about their, their deepest, scariest thoughts, which I don't think get any scarier or deeper than thinking about ending your life. They have to trust us. They have to believe that we care about them. You know, how many times has, has a client said to anybody on this call, you know, well, you're just getting paid. You just do this because you get paid. And clients feel that way a lot of times. So we have to demonstrate to them that we're doing this because we have a calling. Um, I'm sure most of us could say we could do other things and there are probably times when we wish we would have done those other things. But for the most part, we have to demonstrate that we're human and that we want to support them and care about them. So with a client with suicidal thinking, they have to trust us. They have to trust that we care. They have to trust that we're, we're not going to judge them or stigmatize them or send them away or say that, oh, my gosh, you're the sickest client I've ever had. How many times has a client thought that they were the sickest client? So ask yourself the question, how, do you, how are you building rapport? What are you doing to build rapport with clients? What are you doing to establish a, a, a safe place for them to talk about the scariest thoughts that they could ever come up with? And that's the thought of ending their life. So, so suicide is about escaping pain. Suicide is not 
by and large about getting back at somebody. It's not about anger. It's not about, you know, I'm going to show you. I mean, I know that there may be impulsive acts uh, that, that lead to that, but by and large, most people who are considering suicide want to escape intense pain. So we have to explore what causes the pain. And, and, and I found that when you validate that a person is in great pain, they, they can find some comfort in that. You get it. You understand that I'm in a lot of pain. You can understand why I would think about wanting to end my life. It's just so painful. All of these terrible things that have happened, all these losses, all of, all of these things that are going on are just too painful for me to deal with. And I just don't know if I can go on. So I'm not talking somebody out of it. All right? I'm trying to understand their pain. I have to ask the question, what are they facing that's leading them to considering suicide? What is causing them this great pain? And how do I understand it with them? How do I support them in that pain? And how do I help them feel cared for and validated when I know that they're hurting so badly? So the goal is to help the client get through an overwhelming period of time. The focus is on reducing suicidal thinking, helping them lessen the overwhelming feelings, and helping them access help, access assistance, access hope, ultimately. Because people who are in such intense pain don't have hope, or they've lost that hope. So we have to help them reduce it. And, and for me, it's about keeping them alive, which sounds so obvious, right? But keeping someone alive takes a lot of work sometimes. And not just by us. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to sound so narcissistic that we're running around keeping people alive. But what we say and what we do and how much attention and care we give to a person does directly relate to whether or not they live. We have a powerful role in how we handle things. So we need to help them focus on how to reduce their suicidal thinking. So I, when I get to a place where I build a relationship with a client and I start to understand more and more, I want to start asking questions about hope. Okay. Do you have hope? What are your hopes? Do you feel hopeless? Because I can learn a lot about their warning signs when I start to access and understand what it means for them to have hope. What brings them hope? I've had clients that'll say, you know, my dog is the only thing that brings me hope. Okay. What's your dog's name? Tell me more about your dog. I will take that and I'll run with it. I want to learn everything I can possibly know about Fido. I want to know what breed Fido is. I want to know how long, you know, they've had Fido. And I've had situations where, excuse me, get a drink here. I've had situations where clients have lost that hope. Their dog died. Do you think I was well aware that that's a warning sign for them? You know it. And did we talk openly about it? Yes. Did we talk about their pain? Absolutely. Because we need to spend the time to understand those unique variables that each client has. And we can't under, under or overestimate the importance. We need to understand exactly what they're, what they're facing. So I don't know how many of you know what Chick-fil-A is. Maybe most of you do or don't. But I think such an important part of the, of the work we do is being nice, being caring, being responsive, um, being a, a my pleasure. Clients that are suicidal tend to either really engage in therapy and engage in treatment or completely drop out. Well, you say, well, that's everybody, right? Well, it's what we say and how we say it and how we treat people that make a difference. And it certainly makes a difference with the suicidal client who doesn't necessarily want to tell us that they're feeling that way. So I put this on here because I think that they illustrate no matter what they stand for or whatever, their customer service is pretty amazing. I think with the suicidal client, we need to be even more customer service oriented. We need to, we need to, of course, have healthy boundaries and so on, but we need to respect the intensity of their emotions and, and, and really be responsive with how we express compassion and empathy. We need to have individual warning signs. Each of our clients, we need to demonstrate that the warning signs have been individualized, that we are not just using cookie cutter warning signs, that we're looking at each of them, having a conversation with them about what leads them to considering suicide and what protects them from suicidal thinking. That needs to be documented. This goes back to the ethical piece. This needs to be documented periodically, frequently, however often you feel comfortable with, which for me is very often. And it needs to demonstrate that you've thought individually, uniquely about that person and that you've incorporated cultural aspects. You've incorporated how they communicate. You've incorporated their unique traits that they bring to the process and that it's clear that you've spent some time thinking about them as an individual. 
we need to have consistent and frequent ongoing screening of suicidal thinking and suicidal behaviors. This is a public domain document. If you're not familiar with the suicide behaviors questionnaire revised, you should be. And I would encourage all of you to at least check this out as a free, easy, well-established, valid, reliable instrument. It's one that we use and it helps you get an understanding of where somebody is at from a suicidal thinking perspective. So I think that's an important intervention is having consistent screening. And it needs to be a persistent discussion that this is not a, a one or two time conversation. This is a persistent ongoing discussion. We don't just use screens to replace clinical interviews, rapport building and persistent communication. Okay, we're using screens to get the conversation going or to explore more about something or somebody might answer in a certain way and you'll go, can you tell me more about that? Help me understand more about that. Because ultimately we're not talking somebody out of death. We're talking them into living. We're talking them into making a, the tough decision to live. And we know that they're in pain. We know they're struggling. We know they're hurting. And we want to talk them into the possibility of just staying alive, of living and flourishing and everything else. That's our goal. That's my goal is I want to try to help somebody find hope and purpose and feel like there's a good reason why they keep living. And we don't do that by guilting people into things. We know that, right? I think when I first started, I was trained in, in different ways, in a lot of ways. I was trained in a different addictions model. I was trained in a, in a lot of different ways. But luckily, we're allowed to grow. We're allowed to change. But I was trained in a method where you would like almost kind of guilt them into it. Well, you know, you can't do that because, you know, you believe in God and that means you're going to hell. I mean, how could you do that to your children? Right? You, your children love you. Like we're going to somehow come up with some magical guilt antidote that's going to have them go, yeah. But if we remember that suicide is about pain, it's not about those things. It's about someone being in so much pain that they want to avoid pain. If you think about the worst migraine or the worst headache you've ever had, the automatic natural reaction is to reach into a medicine cabinet and get some Tylenol or Advil or aspirin or whatever you take, right? Because you have a headache. Your head hurts and you want to be out of that pain. Imagine that pain every single day of your life. Imagine that emotional pain weighing you down every day. OK, to a point where you don't want to be alive. You can't guilt somebody into staying alive. You can't say, well, what about your kids? That's just not how it works. So we have to use some validating responses. And here are some characteristics. Um, communicating that the patient's feeling makes sense within or his or her circumstances. Actively accepting the patient and communicating this to the patient. You know, the patient's thoughts and feelings are always taken seriously and not you know, discounted or trivialized. And validation is not saying we're endorsing or agreeing. You all know this, right? That we're not saying because we understand they're in a lot of pain and we can understand why that pain can lead them to thinking about suicide. It doesn't mean that we're saying, yeah, I get it, you should suicide. It's not a permission to suicide. And validation facilitates a good therapeutic alliance, okay? And this is Martha Linehan, who's done so much amazing work in the world of working with self-harmers and people that struggle and with personality disorders and suicidal behaviors and so on. So, so some of the key interventions that we want to encourage everybody to think about, we want to be mindful and, and work very closely with any prescribers and be very mindful about prescribing medications, um, asking and, and doing more work in the area of primary care physicians and understanding what medications they're prescribing. Um, I like to, to, to understand and learn as much as I possibly can about what medication somebody's on Oftentimes, I will find that they're on all kinds of different medications that could be life altering, could be dam damaging, dangerous, or could lead to suicide. We again work closely with the families. Suicide is not an individual problem, it's the whole family system. And we need to, over time, invite the family into part of the process. We need to add, add an appropriate substance use assessment, meaning that if we don't know a whole lot about substance use, we need to learn more about it and we need to assess for substance use even more than we probably do already. We need to help them build social supports in recovery. And what are the social supports in recovery? We need to communicate with all providers, you know, this, this coordination of care, and we need to use a motivational approach. That's my style. Certainly there's other styles. When I say motivational approach, I'm a cognitive behavioral guy but I also use different traits of psychodynamic work because I work for a psychodynamic hospital. And so I use pieces, whatever's most effective for the client that I'm working with, but 
I tend to like to use motivation because I'm trying to help somebody find a reason to live. And I don't do that just haphazardly. I try to find a way that someone can keep going and move forward. So, so some of the interventions that we look at are the, the most important aspects is that we look at it from a crisis stabilization standpoint, surviving any suicide episodes where we contain, where we reduce means, where we add emotional support. And then the treatment piece, of course, is we're treating the depression, the hopelessness, helping them build coping skills so they're not at a deficit, addressing self-hatred, relationship issues, family involvement, and so on. And then we're going to help them develop a safety plan, which we use in treatment and aftercare. We create an aftercare plan in, in our setting. And then we, of course, as I've already talked about, we provide local crisis resources. So what's a safety plan? A safety plan is a document and anybody wants, um, I will share my email and I will send you a copy of our safety plan as well. It didn't copy well into a PowerPoint, but I'll, I'm happy to send you a copy of our safety plan. But the components of a safety plan are that we look at the warning signs. We have a conversation where we're sitting with the client side by side, if needed, having this discussion together. What are the warning signs? What do we know? What are your warning signs? You know, what, what do you think they are? And in, in educating and working with them. Then we talk about their coping skills. What has helped you in the past manage this feeling? What has helped you manage your sadness, your depression? What has helped you cope? And then what are some coping skills you think you can use? I have a client right now that's big into music and they have three different coping skills related to playing music or learning about music or going onto YouTube and watching music videos, whatever it takes. And we have to be creative. We have to be thinking outside the box, whatever coping skills someone has, we have to figure out what they can do. And we've got to be as creative as possible. It includes the people that you can call, the relationships that you can count on, the people that you could reach out to when you are, are not in a great place. So when you see the warning signs and you're trying to use coping skills, who can you call? Who can support you? Who can help? And then the second piece is who can actually help if you go beyond that and you really are at a place where you're saying, gosh, I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can survive. I'm really contemplating ending my life. So who do you call? And that goes back to what I've been saying about crisis resources, going beyond our old techniques. Who are they going to call? Who can they really count on at two o'clock in the morning? What can they do? Who can they access? And that connects back to the professionals who can help as well. And then practical environmental safety issues, agreements to take things out of the home, agreements to understand certain places that are risky. You know, a client that's suicidal who says, well, I feel the best when I'm meditating at the top of a mountain. No, that's not part of a safety plan. Okay, that's not part of a safety plan. We need to come up with an environmental option of meditating at the bottom of a mountain or meditating in a safe place. We're not going to be meditating at the top of a mountain when one of your ways of dying is jumping off of a cliff. And I, I use that as an example because that's a literal example I have with, with a client. And I'm like, no, we're not going hang gliding. We're not doing risky, dangerous things. That's not part of it. But that's part of the suicidal thinking kind of coming out. Well, maybe I'll go hang gliding and I'll accidentally just not lock in well enough. Literally had that conversation with a client. All of this stuff matters in terms of the details. What are they thinking? Well, they were thinking about going zip lining and Maybe they wouldn't just, uh, you know, stay locked in and that way the insurance would cover and they wouldn't have to worry about that. And their family wouldn't have the stigma and the shame of suicide. More people suicide than we know. Okay. Because people get creative and make plans. We can help prevent that by understanding that and by actively engaging them in conversations about their deepest, darkest, scariest thoughts. I don't like having those conversations when someone says, Hey, you know, I'm going on a trip to Mexico and we're going to go zip lining. And I have to ask the question, you know, does it enter your mind that when you're zip lining, you know, that could be a time? Is that something that's entered your mind before? And, and it's amazing to me because I, I think when I first started asking questions like that, I worried that, oh my gosh, I just created this idea. I did not create the idea because I will tell you most all the time when I ask those questions and it is actually something they were thinking about. Okay. It's like, I'm glad I ask because now it's in the open and now it's part of our safety plan. Okay. But if we don't ask, it's not going to be volunteered to us. Okay. So somebody asked about protective factors. Here's a list of protective factors that are, I think, very, very important. 
strong connections to family and community support. I mentioned that I'm an attachment guy, meaning that I use attachment theory in a lot of my family work. So every client that I work with, I do their attachment style. I understand how attached they feel, how secure, insecure, the levels and the degrees of attachment that they have. And that helps inform me when I'm developing a plan. And especially with clients who do not feel attached to other people who have a dismissing withdrawn attachment style and they live alone and they're isolated and they don't like pets. And it's just like everything, all the warning signs kick up. Well, if they have connections to anyone, to anybody, I'm going to, I'm going to highlight that. So we look at that as a very strong protective factor. Do they have connection to family and community? Okay. Do they have a fear of pain and a fear of dying? Is that something they really don't want to do? They don't really want to be in pain and they don't really want to die. Okay. So, yeah, now I'm going to answer this as we go through this too. This, what are our thoughts on harm reduction type of coping skills? Like someone who identifies sleeping to avoid or smoking cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just answer it now. My belief is that the most important aspect of all of this is keeping someone alive. And so I'm absolutely going to embrace harm reduction as a technique. Um, I think 30 years ago, if you'd asked me about the idea of harm reduction, I don't think we really had it back then. Um, I would have said, oh, no, of course not. I, 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 did, I don't think so now. Today, I think we have to do what it takes. So what our goal would be eventually, like if they were using sleep as their coping, would be how do we get you from using sleep as your automatic coping skill to not smoking cigarettes? How do we move from that? How do we shift from that? Okay. How do we shift from that? And into a place where sleep is no longer as important or it's no longer the primary coping skill. And for so many of us, if we think about just changing behaviors or changing habits, it takes time. It takes time for us to do that. So I'm willing to embrace harm reduction, whatever it takes to keep somebody living and keep somebody with me and keep somebody going. I'll do it. I mean, aside from, you know, harm reduction is I'm going to, you know, do something dangerous. I mean, it's not harm reduction if they're creating enormous harm. So there's a difference. So I always look at cultural and religious beliefs that discourage suicide. I spend time learning about their, the way that they talk about it in their families, within their own individual, unique culture. What are some of their thoughts about self-preservation? Obviously, when we're doing an assessment, the basics that we're always doing assessment, we're learning about family history. You know, I didn't spend a lot of time on some of the basis, the basic stuff. The basic stuff we've all had, stuff like, you know, you ask about, do they have a family history of suicide? and and, uh, you know, have they had attempts? Of course, you're going to ask all those regular normal questions. My point today is we got to go a lot deeper than that. We got to understand them, their culture, their belief system, their family system, and so on, because this is a protective factor for them. This, we have to understand their support through, through ongoing medical and mental health care. Um, who, who, do they, who do they rely on? You know, who in their life do they trust from a medical or mental health perspective? Do they have access to effective clinical care and support when they need help? Do they have a limited access to lethal means, highly lethal means of suicide? Like, has there been some work done to eliminate guns or to keep guns locked where they can't get them or to reduce access to medications or other lethal means? The person who brought the rope and had the rope in their, in their room ready to go, you know, were they willing to get rid of that? That's a protective factor. Are they willing to take steps to reduce means is a protective factor. Do they have any future perspective? Do they have, what are their values? What do they classify as their meaning? And what are their goals? What do they want to accomplish? And I will, I will highlight these things. I will jump on these things. I will work closely with them. Let's take a look at this. Let's keep working on having a very strong future perspective. So these are just some of the protective factors that we focus on in, in my work. And uh, the caveat to all this is we can't be lulled by protective factors. The research has not said that if someone has a, a particular religious belief that they're not gonna suicide. Okay, people who have a religious belief that suicide equals going to a dark place, um, they still suicide, it happens. Because remember, suicide is about pain. It's not a value commentary. It's about pain. And when you want to escape pain, you will uh, ignore all the rest of it. Okay. So this is again for your reference to take a look at some of the research on cognitive behavioral therapy and suicide. Please take a look at that when you get a chance. Ultimately, I'm a big fan of helping people find purpose. Freud said man lives for purchase or for pleasure. 
And so I think about things from a purpose standpoint, a pleasure standpoint, what brings them pleasure. I literally sent a client last week to get cookies at a place called Crumble Cookie. Crumble Cookie is this amazing, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but uh, they're an amazing place. His intervention at the end of the session was to go to this cookie place. Not only did he go, he sent me a picture of the four cookies that he was eating and it brought him great pleasure and it brought him a smile and it helped us connect on cookies. So, and everything else. So let's be creative when it comes to interventions with our clients. Okay. Ultimately, the last thing I'm going to say before I have five more minutes to answer any questions and that you might have, and, I'm, and I know there's a lot of material to cover here. I've condensed a lot into 90 minutes um, is our own self care. Working with clients in general is exhausting. Working with clients who could potentially be considering ending their life is more exhausting. So we've got to acknowledge our own feelings, the intensity of our feelings. We need support from our colleagues. We need to debrief. We need to ask. I'm blessed with working with nine other clinicians that are part of my team. And we have team meetings and conferences and peer reviews and discussions all the time. And it's such a helpful part of this. And I've had plenty of phone calls at night from someone saying, hey, I have this situation. What do you think? What should we do? How do we address it? Because we don't do this alone. We can't do this alone. We have to share our feelings. How are we doing? How are we feeling? I know sometimes we don't want to contaminate our family and our friends, but it's okay to use support and to share how we're doing. We want to avoid over-involvement, meaning that part of developing a safety plan is helping the client take control of their own feelings and of their own mental health. We, want, we don't want to serve as the person keeping them alive and keeping them safe. I know that sounds a little contradictory compared to what I said before, that we're very, very important. We're very important but we don't want to get to the point where they're going to call us. There's an old movie that most of you don't know. It's called What About Bob? I can't use the reference. It goes back to the I pity a fool thing because most people don't know what I'm talking about anymore, but it's a great example of over-involvement and everything else. We can't do that. And we have to know that we're not responsible for the other person's desire or thoughts about ending their life. We can only intervene the best using the best techniques, the best evidence, and the best amount of compassion and care. There's some wonderful resources here that I would hope you would all know about. There's the linked websites. And then I always try to end with a little bit of humor and I just, I, this cracks me up every time. I'm having trouble finding myself. See, that's Waldo and it just cracks me up every time. So that's my presentation. I'm more than happy to, like I said, share the PowerPoint and send out the safety plan. Questions, thoughts? Yeah, uh, we did have a few questions come in, if you wouldn't mind answering. There were a few that came in that you didn't get to. Um, the first one we had was, does alcohol intoxication cause the suicide attempts or they drink to get up the nerve to commit suicide? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. So a person that, that's struggling, and if someone actually has a long-term pattern of using alcohol, they, they have a, a substance use dependence or an alcohol use dependence, or alcohol use disorder, the new diagnostic manual, then they're going to have a higher risk of considering and contemplating suicide just because of the just because of the longevity of how they've been using and everything else. But the other piece of that is absolutely true as well, and that is people who are already considering suicide will find themselves much more readily able to impulsively complete suicide because of their alcohol use because they are in a state. Alcohol is a depressant. We all know this, and we've all been around people that are the happy drunks, the unhappy drunks, the depressed drunks, the angry drunks. And so for someone who uses alcohol to cope, over time, when you're struggling with depression, it's going to lead to more and more depression. It's gonna deplete the body's and the brain's normal ability to help you feel better. And so I believe it's a little bit of both that ultimately leads to a huge warning sign when someone's drinking, a huge warning sign for the risk of suicide when we have a client that is an alcoholic or, or whatever term we want to use. Okay, the next one um, was referring back to the beginning. When you were talking about substance use, were you specifically referring to illicit and opioid substances only, or um, does that include other mental health pharmaceuticals? Yeah, it can say, what I think about in my use of substance use is really anything we're abusing. And so, and we can certainly abuse psychotropics. Um, 
plenty of psychotropics get abused, the ADHD medications, the benzos, the anti-anxieties, and so on. So I was certainly talking about all the abusable drugs. When people start to abuse substances as a way of coping, that's when they increase their risk of suicidal thinking and suicidal behaviors. It's the abuse, abuse of the substances, and that includes pain medications, whether that's uh, you know, an opiate or a heroin, which isn't obviously a prescription drug, um, and so on. So I was, I'm really talking about the, the aspect of abusing the substances, whatever that substance is. Okay, perfect. Um, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, are you able, to, we did just have a couple more things. Um, I didn't know if you were able to stay on for I another can. couple minutes. I always try okay. to print accordingly so I can answer any other questions, certainly. Okay, perfect. Um, so the next one is, why is the government not strict about alcohol use and accessibility compared to other drugs? Oh my gosh. That's a week long lecture and everything else. There's so much historical <laughs> historical information in that question, um, or really even in the answer. So uh, I think it's part of our culture. And I think at least I can speak for a living in Texas, taking away alcohol here is equivalent to taking away guns in Texas. So it's part of our culture. So I think that the, the government's not gonna battle people for that. Um, we know that pound for pound, alcohol is the most dangerous, most destructive of all substances. You can combine all the rest of the drugs together and we don't have as much of an implication on society as we do for alcohol. Um, in terms of domestic violence, accidents, physical problems, financial issues, all the things that come about because of alcohol use, but we have strong lobbying efforts. We have strong financial reasons. You know, you can't watch a sporting event without having alcohol ads on it. So, you know, I don't want to get too soapboxy about it. We certainly have a lot of powerful influences that keep alcohol as strong as it is. Okay. Um, the next one is, is psychotherapy useful for reducing suicide attempts in someone who is currently using or abusing substances? Yeah, everything I talked about today was in the context of the therapeutic relationship. And so I'm a therapist, I'm a psychotherapist, and I, I put a piece, I didn't have time to really get into cognitive behavioral therapy, but whatever technique people, somebody's gonna use, you have to apply that technique to building that relationship, building the rapport. It's absolutely, the relationship and therapy with a client who is suicidal is absolutely effective. It's absolutely essential. Having that trusting therapeutic relationship where someone can tell you honestly what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, that's necessary. It has to happen. That has to be part of this process. So yes, the research plays that out left and right, that it's about that therapeutic relationship, that that makes all the difference. That if someone, and, and, and that's on us, if we're building that relationship, no matter where it is, whether it's individual therapy, whether it's an agency, whether it's a hospital, whatever it is, if we're building a relationship with someone and demonstrating that we care about them, we have compassion, we understand, then that can lead to the positive outcome of keeping somebody alive. But yes, there's, there's a volume of, of research in that area that's very positive for all the things I've been talking about today. I tried to, to notate some research in, in quite a bit of this, but that absolutely is the case. All right, how um, are you able to distinguish between those who need habilitated and those who need rehabilitation? Okay, so one more time, how do I distinguish what? How do you distinguish between those who need habilitated and then those who need rehabilitation? Huh, I guess we're talking about substance use um, for the most part. So, so what I try to do with clients is number one, I try to figure out what it is that they're willing to do. <laughs> what are you willing to do? And that's a huge part of motivational interviewing or motivational enhancement therapy. What are you willing to do? And I think when I first started in this field, it was very much, we tell them what they're gonna do. And if they don't do it, they're in denial and they're lying and they're this and they're that. And, and I learned over the years that, wait a minute, it's about um, engaging them on what they're willing to do. What are they willing to do? And then at the same time, I have to determine what I'm willing to do. Can I, can I work with that? If someone says, I'm not gonna go get help, I'm not gonna go get treatment, I'm gonna keep doing heroin, 
I, I can't work with that. Right. And the same thing is I'm going to keep drinking and driving. I'm going to keep doing these things. So, so for so much of it is what are they willing to do? What is their capacity for making changes? What is their motivation for making changes? And, and what is it that I feel that they should do? What's the plan that I'm offering or the recommendations that I'm making and, and do they align? So the differences between levels of care, between where they are in treatment has so much to do with those, those two factors, what they're prepared to do, what my recommendations are, and whether or not they'll do them. All right, um, and the last question, and then there was just a couple of comments. Um, the last question though is, um, what was the name of the suicide uh, questionnaire that you spoke about? One of yeah. our Mm -hmm. attendees didn't have enough time to write it down. Sure. I'm going to go right back to it. Oops. It's the SBQ, but I wanted to, there's a whole link for it and everything. Here it is. Here it is. So it's called Suicide Behaviors Questionnaire Revised, SBQR. It's in the public domain. If you just put in SBQ-R, you will find it. Perfect. Um, all right, so we do have, there are two comments. Um, one of our attendees today um, is actually uh, currently advocating for legislative support of the new 988 number. Um, so they did wanna know if there were some studies um, that might show people that, who, people who are currently thinking about um, you know, committing suicide that they would not call 911, but they would feel more comfortable calling another number. There's absolutely research in that area. And the research starts with the fact that people feel very uncomfortable working with calling the police. Because, and I work, I'm a consultant for two police departments here in Houston, and we talk about this all the time that they end up being the frontline 911 responders, right? Somebody calls and says, uh, my my wife's my wife's going to kill herself. That's what they'll say, right? They won't say the technical commit you know commit suicide or suicide. She's considering suicide. They'll they'll call and say that. Well, the police show up, right? Well, so the police show up, and they're of course worried about their safety because maybe this person has a gun, maybe they have a knife. What are they doing? What are the suicidal thoughts, right? Well, as soon as the police arrive on the scene, that ends in, ends up enhancing the intensity of the scene. It makes things worse, not that the police are doing anything wrong. They're doing what they're supposed to do. So the research says that if we can, and so I'm, I'm excited to hear that there's an advocate for that. If we can do more to attach mental health services to crisis services, whether that's a 988 number that goes to a mental health team that responds differently, that that's a wonderful approach. And I think the research absolutely plays that out, that anytime we can get to a place where we have mental health trained professionals addressing suicidal thoughts, crisis behaviors, that that's gonna have a much more positive outcome for sure. Okay, and um, last, uh, we did have a attendee that put in a comment, as you know earlier, we had a, another attendee ask about alcohol intoxication and does that cause the suicide attempt or do they drink to get up the nerve? Um, so she did let us in on something that her best friend left her a suicide note specifically stating that she had only had one drink. Um, she attempted suicide so many times but ended up leaving this world by jumping off of a bridge where there was no water underneath and she specifically chose that bridge because of that. So. Mm. Mm. Gosh, that's terrible to hear. And th that's the hardest part of dealing in working in this field is that we hear terrible stories. We hear sad, sad stories. And that's part of the reason why I do these presentations to try to get us all thinking. I don't have all the answers. I know I don't have all the answers. I just want us all to think about our approach and think about how we can do more to try to save lives. What can we do to change our practice, to change how we operate? What can we do more to learn how to? Because Suicide is, is, is something we can prevent, but we've got to do more. And people that are advocating and stories like that remind me of that, that we've got to do more to, to do our best to try to help people find a reason to live, to help them manage the pain and to move forward. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, and on a more positive note, I did want to thank everybody for participating and sending in your questions and comments and also thank Dr. O'Neill for such a wonderful webinar. Um, you actually landed off at a perfect place for us um, because I did want to remind everybody that next month in April, we are having a webinar presentation on targeted self-care. Um, so please feel free to join us. Um, everything is posted. The registration is open on our website. And we also have had a lot of people um, asking again about the slides and the webinar recording for today. So we did want to remind everybody that we will have the PowerPoint along with today's recording of the presentation uploaded into our webinar library, which is located on the IRETA website by early next week. We may even get it up sooner, um, but we're going to, you know, try our best. And another thing we wanted to make note of is that we have recently made some changes to our Maya Reda profile page. So we want to just ensure that we're delivering, delivering quality webinars and presentations to our current account holders. When you log into your Maya Reda account, you will be automatically landing on your profile page. So we ask that you just take a few moments to update your profile and answer some questions. Um, and we do want to remind everyone, of course, of the evaluation and CEU process. You're going to receive several follow-up emails from us. The first one will include a link to the evaluation, and the second will include step-by-step -step instructions on how to obtain CEUs for today's presentation. Please note that it will take up to 48 hours for your CEUs to become available. We do have to cross-check and verify attendance records. We would like to especially request that you fill out a, your, our evaluation. It should take no more than two minutes of your time. And again, we just want to thank everyone for taking time out of your day to participate. If you have any questions at all, please email us at info.ireta.org. And with that, we're going to conclude today's, today's webinar. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.